The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone from whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during an in the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests has, had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide which each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was no uh, noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last.
and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw this, that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I have to tell you that I've for some time had some question about the way our church commemorates and celebrates Palm Sunday. I'm not going to win on this. We've done Palm Sunday in this way for over a millennium, but I have often wondered if we should not just lean into the way that Holy Week recapitulates the events and not read this passion story five days early. When you come on Good Friday, we'll read the Passion according to John, as we do every year. We'll do exactly this same sort of reading of the Gospel, laid out as though it were a play with lines for me and lines for you. And so I wondered if we're going to do that on Friday anyway, why do we skip ahead on Good Friday? Suppose in a way what people say is something realistic. Well, Michael, they say, they're not coming on Good Friday. This is the time they read it. And I suppose that's true sometimes. I hope it's not true of you. But it's still not a very good reason. But I've been rethinking that this year anyway. It seems to me particularly meet and right to read the Passion, to read the story of Jesus' death right after we read the story of the Palms. I was convinced of this not by the reading that we had from Mark 11 or even from this uh, Passion story, from, uh, also from Mark, but by something that came up in my Tuesday morning Bible study. It's this line from the, at the end of the previous chapter. As they are approaching Jerusalem, on the way, Jesus has been telling them stories about His own suffering and death. They haven't been taking it well. You know these stories. It starts with Peter at Caesarea Philippi, and it occurs again and again. Jesus does something wonderful, and His, his disciples say, you're doing a great job. And he says, we're going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be crucified. And they say, man, why are you such a downer? Let's just celebrate while we can. That's not a literal translation, but still, that's the dynamic that we see all through the earlier chapters. And then when they approach this last entry into the city, this is what Mark writes. He says, as the disciples were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. Okay, do you get the geometry of the procession? They are all going together up to Jerusalem, and Jesus is going, and His disciples are going, but Jesus has wandered ahead. As they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, Jesus was walking ahead of them, and the people, the crowds that were around Jesus, they were amazed, but the disciples who followed were afraid. Jesus walked ahead. The crowds are excited, but those who are with Him are worried, anxious, and afraid. You see, at this point in the story, there's a big difference between the crowd that has been following Jesus, and the crowd that now assembles around Him. There's a smaller group, maybe 12, maybe 40, maybe 100 or so, depending on how you read the Scriptures. But there is a smaller group who have been following Jesus from day to day, and they have a plan. They have a plan to follow Him so that wherever He is, they will be. They will follow Him so that they can listen to what He says, so that they can learn to talk like Him and think like Him. 
They follow Him day to day so they can watch what He does so that they can learn to do that too so that little by little, at length, they not only can be where He is and talk like Him and think like Him, but they have actually become like the Master. They have become, in their own way, Him. They are apprentices who follow the Master so that they can become like the Master. They are students. They are disciples. They follow Him with the intent to be like Him. And there is a crowd. And the crowd is excited. The crowd is excited because they see coming a day they have longed for, maybe all of their life. They have never known a free Jerusalem. They may have heard stories about the oppression of the Syrians and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians. Some of them may have even heard stories more recently of the heroes who struggled against the Greeks who oppressed them. And now they live under the grand rule and iron fist of Rome. But they know there was a promised king one who was coming like the ancestor David, one who would, like David, enter Jerusalem and, like David, drive all the non-Jews out and establish a pure monarchy and a purified temple so that God would be glorified and those who glorify God would spread from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. They heard stories about Jesus, and when they saw Jesus coming, they said, that's Him. The ancestor, the one who follows David, the son of David, the coming king, the revolutionary king, the great warrior who will purify our people. They could not be farther apart in their minds just as they are separated in their bodies. The crowd that is around Jesus and the disciples at the back. The crowd who are excited and his friends who are afraid. And soon... That crowd that is around him will turn on him. Not because of what he says, not because of what he does, but when he is arrested and imprisoned, it is clear he is a failure. He will not run the Romans out. He will not purify Palestine. He will not liberate Jerusalem. He is not what they hoped for. And those who shouted just days before, Hosanna to the coming King, said, Away with Him. Crucify Him. Sick transit gloria mundi, right? So fleeting is the glory of the world. What the world gives in terms of honor, the world can take away just as easily. The crowd that gives Him love can withdraw it. Some of you know that. Some of you have experienced it. Some of you have known that relationship with the world. Some of you know the way that somehow the world turning against you, failures in the world, suffering in the world, pain, can drive a person to faith. Somehow you know that you have the experience of becoming a Christian and even that making your worldly life a little better. That's true. That happens. It's understandable because of this way of life. When a person gives up the sort of struggle that we live in the midst of a fallen world, when you give up scheming and plotting and struggling and scraping things together, when you develop honesty and compassion, it improves your relationships. It improves your relationships in your family. It improves your friendships. It improves Sometimes your business relationships. It can be that hearing the gospel stories about, uh, about contentment and about generosity leads you to a different sort of financial stewardship. And your financial life comes together in a way it would not have before. And you seem to flourish because of Christianity. But I'll tell you this. For every person 
who has come to faith because they've experienced suffering in the world out there. And for every person who has come here and found their life made better by following this way of life, there are many who have been driven from faith because of their experience of suffering. Suffering and loss drive them from the faith. If that's where you are now, I want you to hear this. If you are wrestling with disappointment and loss, I will tell you that the promise of this faith is not so much that life can be better so much as life can be different. The Lord Jesus spoke to us of a life that was not just a better version of the one we have. He spoke to us of a life that is different from the life of the world. It's like light and darkness, like day and night, like life and death, he says. A different kind of life with a different kind of values and that he called the kingdom of God. It was for the kingdom that he lived and preached and healed. It was for the kingdom that he was willing to accept the hollow praise of the crowds and endure their scorn and betrayal. It was for the kingdom that he suffered and died. It was for a different sort of life that the Apostle Paul went and preached, that all of the apostles, inspired by the Spirit, went and preached and witnessed and suffered and died in faith. The letter to the Hebrews in the middle of his grand catalog of the great heroes of the faith and what it means to live by faith says this, all of these, all of these heroes died in faith without having received the thing promised, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on earth. For a people who speak this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of what they left behind, they could have returned. But as it is, they desire a better homeland that is a heavenly one. This faith is about receiving a gift. A gift of strength a gift of consolation, a gift of community, a gift of acceptance, and above all, a gift of a different way of life and a different destiny. Over the next few days, as we gather for Holy Week, we'll be exploring more closely what it means to be offered a gift by God. What it means to live a different sort of life in a different sort of kingdom, a kingdom that is not earned or are bought by struggle, but is a free gift from a God who loves us. We'll talk about the many gifts that God offers us. We'll talk about what it costs God to be able to offer us this sort of gift. And we'll talk about how it is that you receive the gift of new life and new hope here and now. I hope that you will join us as we walk with Jesus during Holy Week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.